I'm Eugenie Scott. I'm the former executive director of the National Center for Science Education. I'm currently retired, but I still keep my hand in a little bit for helping to make sure that students in the United States learn about evolution and climate change. Oh, I was always interested in science. I, I can't remember when I wasn't interested in science, although technically speaking, technically speaking, I, it would probably be more accurate to say I was interested in nature. There's a difference because science is the study of nature and I didn't uh, quite get into that until probably university level, quite honestly. Um, unfortunately, K through 12 uh, science education in the United States doesn't always, at least when I was going to school, but that was back in the Pleistocene, doesn't always uh, get into the, um, uh, the actual aspects of science that, the way we think of it today. Well, I got very interested in evolution when I was uh, probably in middle school uh, because my older sister brought back her uh, college textbook in anthropology. Anthropology, what's that? That's a big word. So I started paging through the book. They had these great reconstructions of Neanderthals and Homo erectus and all these fossils, and I just thought they were great. It was just so exciting to see all this. So what's this? This is anthropology. Okay, I want to be an anthropologist. And then I became one. <laughs>
uh, land temperature and ocean temperature. I mean, th this is not what really motivates people. What motivates people to uh, fight against climate change or revolution is some sort of ideological or emotional um, uh, concomitant to this controversy. In the case of evolution, the ideology, of course, is religion. Uh, people of particular Christian views, uh, and of course in Great Britain it's, it's Muslims, but people of certain uh, conservative, religiously conservative Christian views don't want their kids to be taught evolution because it has consequences for their religious views. People of certain political or economic ideologies don't want their kids to be taught climate change because the you know climate change has consequences for their particular ideological views so it's really not about the science it's really about the ideology one of the first things that we noticed about parallels between the anti-evolution and anti-climate change movements was tactics because the uh, the first tactic, of course, is to attack the science. The science of evolution is weak. The science of, cl of uh, global warming is weak. Therefore, you we can reject them. The second thing that we noticed about the parallels between evolution and climate change is that it's not so much the science as the consequences of the science for the particular ideology. Conservative Christians believe that if evolution is true, then the Bible is false, there is no God, uh, there is no salvation, you will not be reunited with God at the end times. And these are very, very important issues. Children will not have a moral rudder to guide them. You know, there are very, very important issues uh, at stake if evolution is true. In the case of climate change, where it's more of a political ideology and or an economic ideology, the concerns are more along the lines of, well, if climate change is true, that means that we're going to have to strengthen central government because we're going to have to take steps to curb uh, uh, the carbon production so that we can reduce the amount of CO2 in the air. That means a bigger central government. As political conservatives, we don't want a big, cons we don't want a big central government. It means we're going to have to put some constraints on capitalism, that socialism. So there's a lot of things that political conservatives are going to lose also if climate change is right. Another parallel between the evolution and the uh, climate change controversies is that the consequences for the idea ideology are stressed. So the ideologues on both sides frame the top, frame the controversy in terms of you've got to choose. Uh, you either are a good guy, Christian creationist, or you're a bad guy, uh, atheist evolutionist. There's a line in the sand and it's a, they dichotomize the issue. In the case of climate change, it's another dichotomy. It's a different dichotomy, but it's still a dichotomy. You're either a good guy, conservative, um, um, capitalist uh, who rejects climate change or you're a bad guy socialist uh, liberal uh, who accepts climate change. So people hearing these messages, if they are politically conservative, well naturally I've got to you know, take this point of view, otherwise I'm not being true to my, to my values. Similarly, people who are religiously conservatives, well I have to take this value because otherwise I'm not being true to my values. So there, are, there definitely are non-scientific issues that you have to deal with in this issue, in, in dealing with these controversies. In working with the evolution issue, we found that the best way to get somebody to accept the science is to have a message delivered by somebody that they trust that will assuage their fears that they have to choose between faith and science. And so evangelicals who accept evolution are the best ambassadors to the conservative religious community because they're the ones who have the same ideological view, but they also accept the science. So that sets up a, a, um, a clash, so to speak, that you don't expect this, so tell me more. Uh, and similarly with the climate change issue, you have the message that climate change is real, we have to deal with it, let's talk about what sort of policies we can institute, have that message delivered by somebody who is from the same ideological background, somebody who is politically conservative, somebody who uh, is not a socialist. Um, there aren't that many socialists in the United States to start with anyway. Uh, but you know, libertarian and politically conservative views can, can be packaged in a way, shall we say, that allows somebody from that ideological tradition to listen to the science. Now, 
we feel that both the science of evolution and the science of climate change are strong enough so that if a person can listen to them without the ideological fingers in the ears, so to speak, that the science is going to be persuasive. But you've got to get the fingers out of the ears before the science has a chance to work. We have stressed the fact that it's not a dichotomy. The, this dichotomous view that you've got to choose, uh, you're either an evolutionist or uh, you're religious, or you're either a political conservative or you accept climate change. Those dichotomies are what are really um, ruining <laughs> these two controversies. They, they really are very strongly held by the antis on both sides. It is necessary to try to convince people that, no, scientists are really arguing about the details of evolution. We're not arguing about whether evolution took place. Uh, and similarly for climate change, we're concerned about the details of climate change. How far is the ocean going to rise? Not whether it's going to rise, because the planet is warming and there are going to be consequences for that. There's a lot of different ways of trying to help people understand that consensus. One of them is through humor. Project Steve was an effort to try to poke a little bit of fun at the creationists, shall we say. Um, creationists have for years come up with these lists of scientists who doubt Darwin or you know, scientists who reject evolution, and they're always you know, trivial, frankly. Um, and back in the early 2000s, I think it was you know, 2002 or three, something like that, the intelligent design creationist took out these full page ads around the country for uh, promoting this idea that uh, evolution was shaky science. And this was, you know, scientists doubting Darwin. And we found that very annoying. And uh, there were a lot of people who wrote us and emailed us and said, oh, NCSE has to get up a petition. We can get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of scientists to sign a statement about uh, uh, evolution happen. And we thought that was pretty dumb because it was pretty dumb to have a petition of scientists who doubt evolution. I mean, you know, when is science done by vote? You know, I mean, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't vote on how the world works. You, you, you test explanations and you accept the ones that work and you know, that's the way it's done. You don't just raise your hand if you like uh, evolution. That's silly. So we decided that we would poke a little fun at the uh, intelligent design petition of scientists doubting Darwin. They had a hundred scientists who doubted evolution. And so we came up with a list of 200 scientists who signed a statement about, you know, evolution is an important scientific idea, natural selection is uh, very important, uh, don't, teach it, don't, don't teach creationism in school. It was you know, a nicely written little paragraph there. And we got 200 scientists to sign, twice as many, of course, as the intelligent design proponents. But all of ours were named Steve. And, of course, that, you know, generated a big giggle from the press and from anybody else when you think about it, because it's so silly. Uh, I should say Steve's and Stephanie's. You know. So we, uh, we, we've had a great deal of fun with Project Steve. And of course, once we announced Project Steve, um, the Steve's and Stephanie's just keep coming in over the transom. And I think, I think we're up to like 1,400 Steve's or something like that. It's, you get a t-shirt, I guess maybe that's a, <laughs> maybe that's a selling point. I think climate science is different. I mean, there are enough similarities in, in the, uh, the, the approaches that deniers take for both, and, and there, there's enough similarities, but I think it's different enough. When a, a central point of your whole position is that the 5,000 feet of sediments in Grand Canyon was laid down in one year by Noah's flood, that's got to take the cake. I mean, you know, that, that, that is topped only by, that is topped only by the idea that it was cut in a period of a week or 10 days. I mean, that is just so out there, you, you just have to, you just have to give that the gold star. I haven't heard anything quite so zany from the climate science people. Although, uh, I mean, it's fun to kind of just, roll your eyes at some of the things that the creationists believe. But frankly, the anti-climate change people are a whole lot more important 
and they've got a whole lot more political clout and they've got a whole lot more money. And the stakes are really a lot higher. I mean, I think it's very important to have a uh, scientifically literate population and that includes understanding evolution, its role in science, and that's an important thing. But if you don't understand climate science, if you don't understand the fact that the planet is getting warmer, the oceans are getting warmer, the oceans are acidifying, serious consequences are taking place as a result of human actions that are producing more carbon dioxide and other products that increase warming. If you don't really understand that, you are not only scientifically less literate than you should be, but you are also politically and socially a lot less literate than you have to be because we are going to need to take some very serious measures to try to roll back if possible or certainly to cope with the kinds of changes that we're already producing. So yeah, I can have fun with creationism, but I take climate change a lot more seriously. You know, philosophers of science have gotten themselves all tangled up in trying to define what science is. I deal with the general public, okay? My definition of science is really, really simple. Um, science is a way of understanding the natural world using natural processes. And these natural processes are tested against the natural world to come up with some explanations that uh, help us understand better how the world works. Now, pseudoscience, to me, is maybe trying to do the same thing, or at least trying to um, reflect uh, this, this matter of natural inquiry that, that we call science. But they get big parts of it wrong, okay? Uh, the reason why creationism is a pseudoscience is that even though, yes, they're trying to explain the natural world, and yes, they at least go through the motions of trying to test some of their explanations, where they fail is that they, they are unwilling to recognize the data and observations that refute their explanations. And you can't do that and call yourself a scientist. Um, one, one, of the, <laughs> one of the problems with science is that uh, may, may, may the, maybe the most common uh, phrase that a scientist uh, utters is, oh crap, it didn't work. <laughs> because most of the time, your explanations fail. Because, you know, if you test things right, uh, you find out where your, where your weaknesses are, but then you refine and you go back and try it again. If you just ignore all of the evidence that refutes your explanation, you're not doing science. That's, to me, the, the um, uh, sine qua non of being, uh, of being a pseudoscientist. Curiosity. I mean, certainly all the scientists that I've known they are people who are just driven by, you know, gee, I wonder how that works. Gee, I wonder why it's that way. And then you use this process of science to try to f answer those questions, to try to figure things out. Um, it's just a real enthusiasm for figuring stuff out and, and uh, explaining how the world works. Uh, it'd be nice if it were more remunerative, but that's not the way it works. Yeah, boy, if you ever wanted a get-rich-quick scheme, you'd sure go into scientific research. That, <laughs> that is, that's going to um, put you on the gravy train for life. Now, of course, that's absurd. Uh, and what's, what's particularly amusing about this is that the people who are making these claims are often spokespeople for major money interests, uh, coal and gas and oil and other industries that benefit from the current uh, uh, energy for productions that we have. Uh, you don't think these people are going to lose money if uh, the uh, restrictions on um, uh, carbon producing industries are put into effect? You know, things like carbon taxes or even cap and trade, which is 
you know, barely adequate. But yeah, you know, those pe those people are going to be the ones who are going to be losing money. But this is the pot calling the kettle black, and unfortunately, the kettle is not even light gray. <laughs> it's just a totally inappropriate kind of. Uh, you know, the vast majority of scientists who are uh, contributing to improving our knowledge about the natural world um, don't have big fancy laboratories. They don't have big huge salaries. They're not going to retire to cushy uh, uh, second and third homes. I mean, this is, this is not a get-rich-quick scheme, trust me. Have you had any complaints from Bob's or Peter's or John's <laughs> asking why you didn't do a project, Bob? Well, we, we've had wistful requests. Are you going to have a, a project, Norman? No. We, <laughs> it's only funny once. We can only do that. So I'm sorry, you Bob's and Bill's and all you get, you know, you just can't be done, can't be done.